أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحسي نعماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون الذي لا يدركه بعد الهمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن الذي ليس لصفته حد محدود ولا نعت موجود ولا وقت معدود ولا أجل ممدود أما بعد فقد قال الله الحكيم في محكم كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وذنون إذ ذهب مغاضبا فظن أن لن نقدر عليه في الظلمات فظن أن لن نقدر عليه فنادى في الظلمات أن لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين فاستجبنا له ونجيناه من الغم وكذلك ننجي المؤمنين صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات اللهم صل على محمد وعلى For the love of our beloved Prophet and his beloved progeny a second loud salawat اللهم صل for the hastening in the return of our beloved 12th Imam, a third final loud salawat. Today, inshallah, we'll continue with the stories of our beloved prophets, and today's program is dedicated to the story of Yunus alayhi salam. This is the story that occurs not only in the Islamic tradition, but also in the Judeo-Christian tradition as well. Because we find the story of Yunus occurs in the Old Testament as well. And it in fact is a story that is remembered and recited quite often, especially in the Jewish tradition. So every year on Yom Kippur, which is one of the most prominent Jewish holidays of the whole year, which is a day of repentance, a day of atonement from sin, the story of Yunus or the story of Jonah, the son of Amittai, is recited, and this is part of the ritual. Hence, you find this is a story that is familiar not only to the Muslims in this world, but also the Christians and also the Jews. A great prophet of God that multiple scriptures that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down has spoken of. But when you start to go through the story of Yunus in the Bible and the story of Yunus in the Quran, you will find one fundamental difference between the two. A lot of the incidents that take place in this story in both of these scriptures are similar. The idea of the fish coming and swallowing Yunus, as we will discuss, exists in both scriptures. The idea of him being upset with his people and turning away exists in both scriptures and a number of other elements. Except you will find one big difference between the two scriptures. And that big difference is that in the Bible you find this prophet of God. This man who is supposed to be a role model for the rest of God's servants never even goes to his people to bring them the message. And in fact, he is reluctant to take on this mission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to go and speak to his people. And because he rejects this mission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fundamentally, he later on ends up in the belly of the fish. This is very different from the way that the Qur'an tells this story because the Qur'an speaks of Yunus as one of the great servants of God and a servant who went to his people, called his people for more than three decades. And finally, at the last step, when he was supposed to be even more patient, he might have lost that last level of patience and left his people. Hence, you find the Qur'an is always taking care of the prophets of God. And in other scriptures, their stories are altered. In other scriptures, their stories are brought down to the level of you and I as normal servants of God who disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who do as they wish, 
But the Quran speaks of Yunus as a special servant of God. Hence, you find this fundamental difference between the story of Yunus in the Bible and the story of Yunus in the Quran. And this is something that the Bible has done not only to Yunus alayhi salam, but a number of other prophets as well. In the story of Musa and Harun, you will find that they are also reluctant to even go and speak to Fir'aun. Whereas you find in the story of Musa, he accepted this mission immediately. But why is it that this story is so interesting and why do we want to spend some time on it? Because out of the many prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, maybe Yunus is the only one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells our prophet not to be like him. Usually our prophet is reminded of the work of the other prophets to tell our prophet to be like the other prophets. When our prophet receives rejection from his people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds him, that other prophets also went through this rejection. Yes? Fasbir kama sabara ulul azma. Be patient the way our great prophets used to be patient, and so on and so forth. Yet when it comes to Yunus, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fasbir li hukmi rabbik. Be patient, wala takun ka sahib al hut. And don't be like this messenger of ours. And don't be like this prophet of ours. And don't be like the acquaintance of the fish which is the title that the Qur'an gives to Yunus ibn Matta, Yunus the son of Matta. Today, inshallah, we'll take some time to delve into the story of Yunus, and I can promise you that this story will impact the type of relationship that you have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the way and the perspective you have towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in order to do so, we'll pose the following questions. Number one, this title of Yunus that was given to him, what was the meaning of the title of Yunus? And why was he given this title? Number two, where did the people of Yunus live? Did they live far away from where our prophet used to live? Or did they live in an area that was close by to where our prophet used to live? Number three, when Yunus left his people after more than three decades of calling them to the right path, who else accompanied him while he was leaving his people? And how did he end up in the belly of the fish? Number four, what is the dhikr known as the dhikr of Yunus? What are the different elements that this dhikr consists of? And how much did the Ahlul Bayt encourage you and I to be acquainted with the dhikr of Yunus? Number five, is it possible that a group of people or an individual, you and I, return back to the right path in the final moments before God's punishment comes their way? And is it possible for them to return back to the right path when they see the punishment of God coming their way? And if that is the case, then why is it that Fir'aun was not granted this privilege and this opportunity? And why was his tawbah and repentance rejected? Number six, why were the people of Yunus encouraged to cry and weep as part of their tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And why does God care if I cry and weep to him when I'm repenting to him, as opposed to simply asking him for forgiveness. And number seven, and finally, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala single out the people of Yunus in the Quran? And what lesson can we learn by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pointing out this people in particular out of all of the other nations? Tonight, inshallah, we'll delve into these seven questions with a loud salawat ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. Allah <laughs> The story of Yunus spans over five surahs of the Qur'an and it's very interesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has referenced the name of Yunus quite a bit in the verses of the Qur'an. But there's not too many details from his story mentioned in the Qur'an. Very small bits and pieces. This could be because this is a story that already exists within the scriptures and it's already well known amongst the people. Or it could have other reasons. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Yunus the title that is Yunus, and it comes from the root word of uns, because he used to be acquainted with God. He used to spend time with God. He used to do dhikr, constantly remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And hence he was given the title Yunus. It comes from the root word of yu'nis, like the word mu'nis, the one who has uns with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in particular, when he turned away from his people and he returned back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he was acquainted with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
The narrations tell us that he lived in the land of Nainawa, which wouldn't have been far from the land that we know of as the land of Karbala today. And you find the Prophet when he went to the city of Ta'if in his own life, our Prophet. And he came across this person by the name of Addas and he asked him, what do you believe in? Where are you from? He said, I believe in the message of Yunus who used to live in the land of Nainawa. And the Prophet started to speak about Yunus alayhi salam and called him my brother Yunus, Akhi Yunus. Hence, the people of Yunus and his tribe, they didn't live too far away from the Arabian Peninsula. They lived in northern Iraq. This is where they lived. Yunus starts his mission, he starts his prophethood, and as the beginning of his prophethood starts at the age of 33, he starts to call people to the right path, and narration, some of them say, for 30 years, some say 33 years, some say for 40 years, Yunus continued to call people to the right path. The Quran tells us that his people were more than 100,000, a very large number of people. And out of this 100,000, the narrations tell us that only two people, at the end of everything, when all the three decades are said and done, only two people finally believed in the message of Yunus. Yes, not the best results. These two individuals, the narration tells us some of the names of them. The narration says these two individuals who believed in Yunus, they were different people. They came from different backgrounds. One of them was a man of knowledge. He was a knowledgeable individual. His name was Rubil. And because of that, he had a wisdom with him. Because when you learn about the faith, with it comes a wisdom. And there was another person who believed in him. His name was Tanukhiya. Tanukhiya was simply a man of worship, a man of ritual. He was not a man of knowledge. And the way these two interacted with Yunus was very different from one another. Yunus called his people many years. They didn't believe. At one point, he raised his hands. He said, Ya Allah, now is the time for you to send punishment on these people. There's no more hope for these people. Send your punishment. And the narration says that he insisted and insisted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted his request. Told him that punishment would be sent. But similar to all of the other stories we've been through, never does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send the punishment immediately. He keeps giving his servants time and time and time. And hence he told Yunus, Yunus, the punishment will come upon your people. But the punishment will come upon your people a number of months in the future. And as the narration says, in the month of Shawwal, in the middle of the day, your punishment will come. Why the middle of the day? You will understand as the story begins to unfold. Yunus walks away. He came to one of the two believers that he had. Came to Tanukhya. Came to Tanukhya, the worshiper, the man of ritual. Not knowledge, just worship. Came to him, he said, this is what has happened. I have prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and my request has been granted. Tanukhiya said, wonderful, these are a people who will never believe. So Yunus said, I'm on my way to go and tell them that this punishment is coming. But Tanukhiya said, listen, you don't need to tell them. They already know their punishment is coming, walk away. Yunus went to Rubil, he said, Rubil, this is what has happened. This is the man of wisdom and knowledge. He said, what do you think I should do? He said, Yunus, maybe you could have been a little bit more patient with them. But if God's punishment is going to come, at least inform them so that they know God's punishment is going to come. Do this at the very least. Yunus agreed with what Rubil had to say. He went to his people with Tanukhya, with the Abid, yes? And he started to speak to his people, listen, God's punishment is already granted. It's already a done deal. In the middle of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment is going to come. He told them the exact day that this punishment would come. The people heard from Yunus, they said, Yunus, we're done with you. They pretty much kicked him out, and Yunus was already tired of his people. He head out from the city. He said, I'm done with this. And the Quran says, this is where Yunus didn't show us that extra level of patience that we expect from a prophet. Was then noon, remember the acquaintance of the fish, yes? Is Zahaba Mughadiban? When he walked away and he was angry. 
Angry, meaning he committed a sin? No, angry meaning in the book of a prophet, this is not what God expected from him. For you and I, Yunus is very patient, <laughs> yes? Three decades. But for a prophet, God expected a little bit more from him. So he walked away. When he was walking away, Tanukhia, the man of worship, also left the city with him. Rubil, the man of wisdom and knowledge, remained in the city because he wanted to continue to speak to his people. They left the city. As they left the city and they started to head out, then the narration says Yunus wanted to leave this land altogether. He went and he saw a ship passing by. He waved the, the ship down. The ship stopped. Asked the ship or this ark to have him on it. They said, Yunus, our ship is full. Yes, we don't have room for you. He pleaded to them. He begged to them. He said, I want to come with you. This land, punishment is coming on it. I want to go on with you. So the narration says, the people on the ship finally agreed to have Yunus on this ship. And as they started to ride away with this ship, what happened all of a sudden? The Quran says that this fish, this large sea creature, some have said it might have been a whale, we don't know the details of this, came and started to surround the ship. The ship can no longer move on with its destination because the narration says every direction the ship wanted to move, the fish would stop it. And the narration says when Yunus would go to the front of the ship, the fish would come to this side. <laughs> and when he would go to the back of the ship, the fish would swirl, swirl around and come to this side. And at this point, it's almost clear who this fish is looking for. So the narration says, and the Quran talks about this, they started to have a little bit of a system where they would choose someone to throw into the sea for this fish because there's no other way this fish is going to let us go. So the Quran says, Fasahama. They started to decide who they were going to put there. So the Quran says, Fasahama fakana min al mudhadin. The narration says, three times uh, they threw their sticks. Every time, Yunus's name came out. So at this point, it is clear to Yunus that he is to leave the ship. So he left the ship. And the Quran says, Faltaqamahu al hut. The Quran says this fish swallowed Yunus. When he swallowed Yunus, what's the first thing a fish does when it swallows something? Automatically starts to digest it. This is the next step. And the narration says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the fish that this thing you've swallowed, this is a servant of mine. It is not your rizq. It is not your sustenance. And hence you are not to harm any of his bones. You are not to harm any of his flesh. You are to keep him within you. This is what the narration tells us. And here is Yunus, a great prophet of God, in the middle of the belly of the fish. The fish is going around, and the Quran says, you know why we put Yunus in this situation? Because when he left us and he didn't show that extra level of patience, for a moment he had a lapse of remembrance that we are in charge. For you and I, this is not a sin. For you and I, this is normal. For a prophet of God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds him immediately. Because his status is a different status. Tomorrow, we'll talk about the zuhd, the abstinence of Ali ibn Abi Talib. His abstinence, our abstinence, very different from one another. Ali says, if I eat from this food, I don't want to burn in hell. You and I might eat from that food 20 times. We'll never burn in hell, yes? Because their level was a different level. So the Quran says, For a moment he assumed that we're not in charge. We quickly reminded him, we're in charge. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaching his great servant, his great friend, a lesson immediately. So the Quran says he was in the belly of the fish. So the Quran says, When you get stuck, what do you do? You come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you get stuck, what do you do? You pray to him. You raise your hands to him. And he started to speak to us in the darknesses. Zulumat. Yes, the Quran could have said, In the darkness of the belly of the fish, he called us. Yes, the Quran says, He called us in the darknesses. 
Why? So Imam al-Rida says in Uyun Akbar al-Rida, Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. Allahum salam Muhammad wa Muhammad he says, you know, Yunus was calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fiddhulumat, in the darknesses, because there were three levels and layers of darkness on Yunus when he was calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There was the darkness of the night that had come. There was the darkness of the sea. He's at the bottom of the sea now at this point. And there's the darkness of the belly of the fish. And the Quran says he was calling us from the bottom of the sea. فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ We heard his dua. What does this teach us about our dua? You and I pray in the middle of daytime. And we say, I don't know if he can hear me. I don't know if he's out there. I don't know if he can even, he even cares. And the Quran says, Baba, فَنَادَ فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ He called me from three levels and layers of darkness. فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ We responded to him. Your dua, I hear. I hear your dua. Maybe I don't give it to you for whatever reason, but I hear your dua. Fanada fil dhulumat. He did a dua. It's a very beautiful dua. It's a short dua. Everyone has to memorize this dua today. Okay? You're not walking out of here unless you memorize this dua. Okay? We're going to test you. That's a joke. But anyways, you have to memorize this dua because it's very short. So he prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a beautiful dua he made. فَنَادَ فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتِ There is no God but you. You're the one in charge. I thought for a second I had a lapse of judgment. No, you're the one in charge. سُبْحَانَكَ You are pure of flaw. You don't make any mistakes. If anything goes wrong, that is from me. It's not from you. إِنِّي كُنْتُ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ I am the one who is the wrongdoer. You're never the wrongdoer. When something goes wrong, you always have my best interests in mind. Three elements. La ilaha illa ant. There's no God but you. Subhanaka. You are pure. Anything goes wrong is from me. Inni kuntu min And this dua became the dua of Yunus. There's a very important point in this dua. I'm going to get to it. This dua that is extremely short, multiple narrations of the Ahlul Bayt tell you and I that this is a dua you're supposed to be acquainted with. So the companion of the Prophet narrates from him that the Prophet told him, he said, if you run into problems, you have issues, do the dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not reject. And that is the dua of my brother Yunus. What is this dua? La ilaha illa ant subhanaka inni kuntu min al The narrator asked this question of the Prophet. He said, Ya Rasulullah, is this the dua of Yunus, the dua that Yunus is supposed to do? Or is this the dua that you and I are supposed to do as well? The Prophet said, no, this is the dua Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us so that you and I would do it. Look at the end of the verse the Prophet told him that the end of the verse says, وَكَذَلِكَ nunjil mu'minin," And this is how we save the believers. So this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, when you're stuck, you want to come back to me, this is the dua that you do. The narrations of the Ahlul Bayt say, before Salatul Fajr, you recite this dua. After Salatul Fajr, you recite this dua. When you have a haja, you recite this dua. When you wake up in the morning, you recite this dua. You get the feeling they wanted you to be acquainted with the dua and the dhikr of Yunus. And of course, most famously of all, this lies in Salatul Ghufayla, the salat that is done between Maghrib and Isha, the short salat that's done between Maghrib and Isha. Why? Because this dua carries something very powerful with it. And that is that you show your vulnerability to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here's the interesting point about the dua of Yunus. You ready for this? The dua of Yunus, you don't even ask anything of God in it. Go ask anybody. Say, what does dua mean? It means when you ask God for stuff. No? La ilaha illa, there's no God but you. Subhanaka, you're perfect. Inni kuntu min al I'm a wrongdoer. Where did he ever ask for anything? He didn't ask for anything. And yet the narrations say, do this dua, it's wonderful. You get your haja, it'll be this, it'll be that. He didn't even ask for anything. And the Quran says, fastajabna lahu. We responded to him. <laughs> So is dua more about what you ask of God or is it more about the relationship you build with God? It's about that relationship you build with God. And this is why the narration says if someone comes 
and he is busy trying to build a relationship with God. And because he's busy, he forgets to ask God for some of the things that were on his list. The angels say, because you are busy with something more important, we will grant you twice of all of the items you missed on your list. The Knights of Qadr are coming. And you will see people, their main focus is a'mal. This a'mal list, this, 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 this. And Ahl al teach us that the most important thing is to build a relationship with God. And the things you remember to ask for, ask for them. There's no doubt about that. And the things you don't remember to ask for, don't worry about it. Because you achieve something bigger than asking God of your bucket list. There's no du'a in this. There's no asking in this du'a. Only thing you do is, oh Allah, I know I'm not worthy. Yes? You are the one who does everything properly. I am the one who has shortcomings. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses this individual. So he called out, and the Quran says something beautiful. The Quran says, if it wasn't for the fact that Yunus kana min al musabbihin, if it wasn't for the fact that Yunus, before he ended up in the belly of the fish, and while he was in the belly of the fish, he was amongst those who would remember us and do tasbih. Lalabitha fi batnihi. He would have removed, remained in the belly of the fish until the day of judgment. What does this mean? This means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking at Yunus. He sees a servant of him who's coming to him, not only when he's in the belly of the fish. Before he's in the belly of the fish, he's speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when things are going well. You remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when things are going well. You obey him when things are going well so that he helps you when things aren't going well. Quran says, Kana min al -musabbihin. He used to be one of those who constantly did tasbih. It's not that he went on his own path and then when he ran into problems, he came to us. No, he's of a higher status. This is why the narration of the Ahlul Bayt says, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the good times. So that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remember you in the difficult times. He was min al musabbihin. He always used to come to us. Yes, now he is in the fish. He's also coming to us and we will save him. We will respond to him. So the Quran says, we had this fish bring Yunus to the shore. وَأَنْبَتْنَا عَلَيْهِ شَجَرَةً مِنْ يَقْتِينَ And we had a plant that is kind of like a form of squash. It's called a gourd plant. Grow upon him to protect him because the narration sin says that though his bones and his flesh were protected, his skin was impacted by the time that he had in the belly of the fish. So he's thrown out. And when he's thrown out, this plant grows upon him to provide him with shade. And he might have even fainted or have lost his consciousness for a number of days. This is where Yunus ends up. Let us go back to the people of Yunus. What happened to them anyways? God told them the punishment was going to come down on them at this time, at this day. It's a done deal. Yunus has already left these people. What happened to them? Slowly, as the time of punishment came closer and closer, the people of Yunus started to see the clouds coming together. The signs of punishment are coming. The storm that Yunus had promised them is now starting to take place. So the narration says they all started to regret what they had done. So they came to the one person who's left in this city who speaks of God. And that is Rubil, the knowledgeable believer in Yunus. What happened to Tanukhia? Tanukhia left. Because he was only a man of what? Ritual. And this is the difference between a person who believes and is knowledgeable and a person who believes and is only into ritual. The one who is only into ritual, he ends up with this rigid form of religion. But the one who's knowledgeable, he knows how to be flexible with the servants of God. Yes? That's why knowledge is so important for us. The religious person who's only into ritual, you come to him and say, this person committed this sin. This person committed this sin, that's it. I can't talk to him anymore. Baba, did Islam tell you to like, you know, not be kind to him anymore? Oh, he's, he committed sin. So Islam doesn't like people who commit sins and that's it. 
No, it's more nuanced than that. It's a lot more complicated than that. It's not as simple as that. This is a lack of knowledge. They came to Rubil. They said, Rubil, we regret what we've done. God's punishment is coming. We believe the message of Yunus now. Tell us what to do. And Rubil said, listen, you all are repenting so late that now you really have to call on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he said, listen, bring yourselves and bring your families, bring your women and your children too. Because you really have to show how vulnerable you are in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, come gather yourselves in the valley, gather your cattle with you in the valley as well. Like you've come with everything you have. And then when you get to the valley, ask God for forgiveness and make sure you cry and you weep as a part of it. Don't just sit there and say, Allah, forgive me. No, no. Cry and weep. I'm going to pause here. Why is crying and weeping so important anyways? Wouldn't God just forgive me if I just ask him for forgiveness easily? Why does God care? Huh? Why does God care if I come to him and then I cry as well? Growing up, I used to hear these lectures all the time. The lectures the Molana used to say, yes? Make sure you cry. It's a night of Qadr. Make sure you cry. Make sure you shed some tears. I always used to wonder why if someone came to me and said, Shaykh, forgive me. And I turned to him and I said, well, if you want me to forgive you, you might as well cry to me first. <laughs> what would you say about Shaykh? <laughs> I would say, this is one arrogant Shaykh. And yet, when you look in the narrations of Ahlul Bayt, they say, no, crying is very good. It's very helpful. See if you can shed some tears. Why? Why does God care if I'm crying and I'm returning to Him? Or I just sit there and I say, Ya Allah, I was wrong. At the end of the day, isn't Tawbah just regretting what you've done? Why does God care if I cry or I don't cry? Isn't make this God look even worse? If you're very forgiving, you shouldn't care if someone cries to you when they ask for forgiveness. You should say, I forgive you. You forgive people even when they don't even ask you for forgiveness, no? Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala care so much? You should cry and you should set, shed some tears. And yes, the people who end up on the day of judgment, all of them will be crying on that day as the narration says, except for three people. One of them is a person who cried in this world from the fear of Allah. Why? Why crying? It's not because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cares about this. It's because you have to understand the severity of your situation. God is not na'udhu billah going on some power trip. He's not trying to make you understand that he's the one who's powerful and all. This is how we do things. It's not God. He wants you to understand how terrible your deed was. Can I come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Ya Allah, forgive me, I'm out. One second, Ya Allah, forgive me and I'm done. Can we do that? Yes, he will forgive you. The narration says before your lips move, he will forgive you. But if you want to understand the severity of your own situation and how terrible your deed was, uh, then you should try to shed some tears. Because what you did, it doesn't hurt God, but it was very bad in its essence. It wasn't just like life is going on. No, what you did was terrible. There should technically be tears. And you will understand better. And it will have a greater impact on you when you cry to him. Otherwise, what does he want to do with your tears anyways? It's not like he's trying to have his desires fulfilled. Oh yes, come and cry to me. No, this is how you and I do things. This is not why God does things. This is why the Ahlul Bayt say, yes, when you come and do tawbah, for your own sake, you should shed some tears. Now if I can't, it's okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you either way. But if you can shed some tears, this is valuable. Rubil said, go cry, mourn, weep. So they came into the valley, the punishment was moving their way. The closer the punishment came, the more they cried. The more they asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. Until the narration says in those final moments, Rubil himself was amongst these people. He was asking God for the punishment to be sent away from them. They saw as the storm is coming towards them, all of a sudden the storm started to move away and went in a different direction. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Israfil to move the punishment in a different direction. Tears of joy in their eyes. Very happy. And what do we learn from this story and this portion of the story? 
what you learn from the story of Yunus is not about the belly and this and that and the fish and all of this kind of stuff. The most important point in the story of Yunus is that there are times where even a prophet of God will give up on his people. And Arhamur Rahimin and God Himself will not give up on His people. Even a prophet of God will walk away, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I'm still here for you. As long as you are not sure that the punishment has already come. Fir'aun, why does Tawbah get rejected? Because he was sure. He knew he was gonna drown. The punishment had not come yet for the people of Yunus. It was approaching them, they still had time. Even in those final moments, the narration that Shaykh al Sadduq has narrated in Khisal, what does he say? He says, when Fir'aun claimed to be God, he said, Ana Rabbukum al -a'la. He said, I am your great Lord. The narration says, Jibreel turned to Allah. Jibreel said, Ya Allah, you're going to just leave him like this? He didn't miss a salat or a fast or, you know, I don't know this or listen to this music or, no, 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 no. What did he do? <laughs> he claimed he was God. And the narration says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala waited from that day 40 years uh, until 40 years later he said, Ma alimtu lakum min ilahin ghayri. He said, I'm God still. And during this time the narration says, Jibreel asked this question of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Allah, you're just going to leave him like this? Tada'uhu? Just going to leave him? He's claiming he's God on earth. What else are you waiting for? And look at this line that the narration says. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to Jibreel. And he said, Only another servant speaks the way you're speaking. Fir'aun is the one I created. He is my servant. I am the Lord. I will be patient with him. I will give him every opportunity. Yes, you are a servant like himself. You don't have the patience that I have with my creation. <laughs> Only another servant speaks like this. If you had created him, you would have been more patient with even the Fir'aun. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that patient with Fir'aun, how many opportunities do you think he will give you and I? to come back to the right path. You committed the sin, you say, oh, Allah is not out there, he's not gonna forgive me anymore. Baba, he gave 40, Fir'aun 40 years. You don't think he can forgive you? You just have to come back, you just have to return. So the Quran says, فَلَوْلَا كَانَتْ قَرْيَةٌ Why aren't there other people in other cities like the people of Yunus? Amanat, they believed in the last moment. فَنَفَعَتْهَا إِمَانُهَا why aren't there more people like the people of Yunus who believed in us in the final moment? And that saved them. Quran says out of all of these nations, why aren't there more people like Yunus who believe in us in the final moment? You and I might be in the final moment too. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you're in the final moment. Why don't you be like the people of Yunus? You couldn't be like the other people who believed in the Prophet from the very beginning. Okay, be like Yunus. The people of Yunus, their belief benefited them. We saved them even in the final moments. And the final lesson to be learned from the story of Yunus is that even if you're a prophet of God, constantly you have to have the remembrance of God in your mind. And you have to rely on him. And Umm Salama says, I came and saw the prophet one day and he was praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Allahumma la takilni ila nafsi tarfat aynin abada. Oh Allah, do not leave me to myself and my own senses and my own abilities even for the moment of batting an eye. And Umm Salama says, I turned to the Prophet, I said, Ya Rasulullah, why are you doing this dua? He said, my brother Yunus had the smallest lapse and he ended up where? He ended up in the belly of the fish. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would remind his servant of his lapse. Hence, I do not rely on myself. I rely on the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lesson number one is for the sinners amongst us. Lesson number two is for the righteous amongst us. If you're a sinner, 
Be like the people of Yunus. They came in the last moment. It still counted for them. And if you're righteous, remember that even if you lapse one moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold you accountable the same way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds the rest of his creation accountable. With that, inshallah, we'll bring tonight's talk to an end. Let's take a moment to recite Surah Al-Fatiha. For all of your marhumin and marhumat, especially the marhumin and marhumat of the sponsors of tonight's program, with a loud salawat ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad.